Today's episode, Childhood's Promise. The first Beatles song I ever heard was I Want to Hold Your Hand. I must have been about three, and my father was singing it as we walked through the hall of our apartment building, my hand in his. The way he sang it, it was as if he had just made it up and he was singing it just for me. In his Brooklyn accent, it sounded like a nursery rhyme. The first Beatles song Zuzu ever heard was Michelle. She was in first grade, and we were sitting in the kitchen when it came on the radio. Zuzu's kindergarten teacher was named Miss Michelle, and hearing that song suddenly filled her up with so much nostalgia for the easier days of kindergarten that she started to cry. Zuzu is 10 now, and she's been on this Beatles kick lately. She goes through our old collection of records and plays her favorites over and over. A lot of those records have been mine since I was a kid. I first really got into the Beatles back when I was about Arizona's age. It was 1980, the year John Lennon was shot, and all of a sudden it felt like there was a made-for-TV movie about the Beatles on almost every weekend. My grade six teacher would play Imagine, and all the girls would cry and ask the popular boys to hug them. Zuzu says that listening to the Beatles reminds her of when she was a baby. She listens while dancing around with her arm raised over her head like there's a ribbon in her hand. She has a lot of great moves in her repertory. Zuzu learned to play piano on a Casio synthesizer that's able to produce a pretty impressive sitar and even has this hip-hop feature that turns the B-flat key into a scratching record sound. Her teacher, a sweet hobbit-like woman with cats, has told us that Zuzu is the most gifted student she's ever had. A few months ago, Hetty, Zuzu's mother, began to say that the Casio was stunting her growth as a musician. Our living room is too small for a real piano, I said. We hardly have room for a coffee table. Hetty knew this was true. But just the same, I began to notice piano cost and piano size in our Google history. I think the thing that finally pushed Hetty to get it was watching the Beatles anthology video. Why did people go to their concerts just to scream their heads off? Suzu asked as we watched. We had rented all eight volumes from the video store. Towards the end, she wanted to know who the little woman in black was who sat there on the piano bench, squeezed in beside John. Hetty said that that was Yoko. She sang songs on John's records that nobody listened to, Hetty explained. That must have made her feel bad, Zuzu said. Near the very end of the last volume, Paul played Let It Be, his bearded baby face staring out over his piano and right into our living room. There was something about seeing him sitting there, alone at a piano. It's funny, Hetty said. When I was younger, it was all about John, but now I'm thinking of all the great songs Paul has done. When she was younger, she said, Everything that came out of John's mouth was imbued with a kind of impatient, strung-out majesty. But all the while, Paul showed up on time and just wrote beautiful songs. She said she figured Paul had probably been a better dad. A couple of days later, she bought the piano. She just went out and did it. She told me later that at the music store, she made her decision so quickly that the salesman actually trotted over to run her visa card through the machine before she could change her mind. For the rest of the week, Hetty and Zuzu rushed about like expectant dads, moving chairs and shelves to make room for the piano. Hetty was worried that it might not fit. She hadn't bothered to measure it, secretly afraid that if it was too big, we would chicken out. If they just bring it, she thought, then we'll have no choice. On the day the piano showed up, the movers proved to be enormous lumberjack types who appeared to be in high spirits. Perhaps because we live on the ground floor and after a day of pulley contraptions and hernias, all they had to do was wheel it in. The easy job seemed to be making them giddy. I remembered back to when I was a kid, when my parents bought me and my sister a piano with dreams of us learning. It was this beat up chip thing that a friend of my grandmother's was throwing out. We lived on the second floor of a duplex, and the movers came in the middle of the night. I woke up out of a deep sleep to hear one of the movers throwing up in the hall from the strain of the move up the stairs. 
My parents never ended up springing for lessons, and the piano just became furniture, something to lean photographs on. Eventually, we forgot it could play music at all, and when we moved, we just left it there. Our new piano fit perfectly, with plenty of room for Zuzu to move back the bench without bumping it into the couch. When the movers left, we stood there, staring at it, black and gleaming. It made everything in our apartment look shabbier, and yet also more dignified. The thing I'm still getting used to is the change in Zuzu's voice when she gets behind the piano. Like Elton John or the keyboardist in Josie and the Pussycats, she sings differently than she talks. She does these trills, and I never would have figured her for the trilling type. When she really gets going, it sounds as if she's channeling Ethel Merman. Hetty bought her a piano book of Beatles tunes, and in the past couple of days she's learned to play The Long and Winding Road. And I don't know if it's the piano or the trills, but when she gets to the part about the road leading me to your door that will never disappear, it's as if I'm hearing the song for the first time. off my nephews at their uh, school the other day. My nephew, the younger one's about five years old. Mm -hmm. And I was standing in the playground surrounded by all these fresh-faced kids all screaming and running around. And I was filled with this deep sadness because I sometimes look at little kids and I just feel this profound sense of despair that sets in. And I know that's the opposite of most people. Uh -huh. Most people look at kids and think about the future or that they're full of potential. Mm -hmm. But all I see when I look at kids or see kids playing especially is I think of squandered potential. Why? Missed opportunities. Well, how come? Well, you know, it may come as a sort of a surprise to you, but I was kind of a precocious kid myself. Mm, I could see that. Like a little and, Doogie Hauser. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all through my childhood, up until about sixth grade, mm -hmm. I was always fed on this promise that something big was coming my way because I could, you know, I was about ten minutes ahead of everyone else. Well, like, what kind of stuff could you do? You know, like... Um, I was a precocious kid. Like, I remember in a fourth grade class trip, we went to see the Mikado. Hmm. And I remember thinking even then... Gilbert that, and Sullivan. Yeah, but I remember thinking the operetta is a little bit of a trite medium. Yeah. No, that's precocious. Right. Anyway, I'm not here to make a case that I was precocious. I'm telling you I was precocious. You're going to have to believe me when I tell you that. Right. But the point is, then I wound up becoming me as an adult. Mm -hmm. So... What I'm saying is that when I go to these schoolyards, I sometimes see these kids, and it's usually some smart kid who comes up and needs help cutting up his hot dogs or something like that, and then engages with you and starts asking a bunch of questions that are obviously way beyond his years. Mm -hmm. When he's doomed to be just another, you know, ash-faced hack riding the train to some meaningless job. Like you. Yeah. Like you. But, well, hang on a second. That's not really true. I mean, you're, you're, you're doing okay. You mean my health? No, I mean, just, you know, your station in life. Um, 
I mean, as part of like one of the great middle, I suppose I'm doing okay. No, no, come on. I mean, like you know, objectively speaking, you're um... a solid mediocre. But I just, I'm saying, I never, as a kid, thought that's what、uh, history was going to hold for me. I, I was, I was filled full of false promises, you know.、Hmm. By like,、um, like you know, they'd say. Your penmanship is no good, but everything else about you is outstanding, or something. And I always thought, well, you know, like, oh, so I'm a genius with bad penmanship.、Mm-hmm. And then it turns out, like, pretty much one of the only things I have to distinguish myself now, like 30 years later, is my penmanship, which is still pretty bad. The children make me sad for many other reasons too. Like, you know, a lot of people think they're cute. Yeah. But. If you subtract the fact that they're kids,、mm-hmm. they're really—it's just like hanging out with a bunch of people who are really stupid because they don't know anything. So they're like, you know, I can't like screw on the lid of my sippy cup or whatever. And you would never put up with that in your friend, but somehow as a kid, it's cute. Well, you know, it's—I mean, they're cute because you know we think of them as being sort of pure and fresh, fresh-faced, you know. Fresh-faced. Yeah. Show me a kid who doesn't have snot running down his fresh face, and I'll show you a store dummy. <laughs> I mean, come on, fresh face. Think about it. All right. So anyway,、uh, so I'm in the schoolyard now,、yeah. watching these kids run around, and they're making, you know, some of them are making normal kid stuff like little piles of leaves or whatever. And this one kid is there with a piece of chalk and is doing numbers on the ground. And I, I get up close, and I'm watching this kid, and they're totally absorbed, writing like a string of numbers like pi. So I ask the kids, you know, what's that? And first of all, the kid's got an English accent, which makes him sound smarter anyway,、mm-hmm. but says something about. You know, my daddy says it's about、uh, architecture should have a balance. So I'm doing some it was some gibberish about、um, math and architecture,、uh-huh. which I'm sure they were just parroting back half of what they heard and didn't understand it. Yeah. But once again, especially coupled with the English accent, it made the kids seem like they were some kind of idiot savant or something.、Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I start engaging with this kid, and the more that we're talking, the more that I, I feel like this kid is sucking me in,、mm-hmm. and I feel like I got to set him straight because. I, I, and I know it's wrong of me because I'm feeling an impulse on the one hand to, like I'm talking to an adult who's irritating me, but on the other hand I recognize this is just a kid and I'm trying to tell myself that.、Mm-hmm. And the kid's also asking me questions, questions that don't have answers. Like what kind of questions? Like of course the kid's not tracking; it's like a skipping record. So the kid somehow is talking about one thing about you know, I like rocket ships. How do they make laser beams? Things like that. And more than most people, I'm equipped to answer these questions. So. Um, Excuse me. Let me just. Uh, uh, wh- how, why are you more equipped to answer these questions than other people? <laughs> you, you, I, you work in advertising. Yeah, I, something that you probably don't know about me,、mm-hmm. which is nevertheless true,、mm. is for two years I competed as a kid on this televised show called College Bowl. I don't believe that. Like、uh, Jeopardy. We had little. Are you serious? Stands and we had buzzers. Yeah. What? So you really were precocious. Anyway, all right. Sorry. So, so he's asking me a bunch of,、um, you know, kind of natural sciences trivia, which is what kids are interested in. Like, wh- well, why don't we have a big laser beam?、And、I'm like, well, you know, you focus light through certain crystals, but you know, actually, the military is in development with certain. And you know, you can't, you can't give a real answer. But I believe in talking to kids as other adults.、Hmm. Anyway, the point is, so I'm getting a little frustrated with this、yeah. kid, and I can't help but see this kid as doomed. The more、well, I talk to this kid, the more I just think, "You're doomed, kid. You are doomed." Well, why would you, why would you say well, that? That sounds like an awfully kind of big pronouncement. Why would why would you? I don't mean that the kid's going to die. I mean, like, the world is not going to come to heel just because you are some precocious kid, and and that's the trouble with being a precocious kid is that you're 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 going to get your comeuppance. Eventually, you are going to be the guy waiting in the airport with your shoes off, standing in the slush like every other schmuck from the DMV. It's just how life is. It doesn't care that when you were in whatever grade you were reading at whatever level. It doesn't care. Eventually, this guy is going to be freaked out about his mortgage payment when he hates his job, just like anyone else. So I'm sitting there with the little architect kid drawing numbers on the ground. Yeah. And this impulse comes over me to set him up and to set him straight and just say, "Look, kid, you know, here's what you can expect when you grow up." Wait, hang on. You were going to say this to a child? Yeah. Well, I, I, at the time, the impulse, remember, was、um, benevolent. I thought I was going to be doing this kid a favor. Okay. Well, what? I mean, what did? I said, you know, look, I want to tell you something. Life is going to be full of disappointments and near misses and just bad luck. And a lot of times, 
bad people are going to win and good people will lose. And so I did this little monologue for about, you know, two, three minutes to this kid while he's, the whole time he's writing his little um, numbers on the ground. Mm -hmm. And um, when he's done, he's still writing the numbers on the ground. So I said, you know, what do you think of what I just said? And um, the kid just sort of looked up at me blankly and was like, what? Like none of it had even registered. Because I think, um, just like how a kid can fall and scrape their knee and get up and keep running, but if you're 40 and you fall, you shatter your hip and your knee and you need surgery. I think um, the kid was insulated enough that they're just inured to any sort of uh, talk like that. It's like holding a basketball underwater. They just pop right back up again. It, I mean, if, if, if that had been you, you know, if you way back when were sitting in your childhood schoolyard and some guy showed up telling you about what your life was going to be, I mean, how would you have responded? Is that something that you would have wanted? I would have just fled had the ghost of Christmas future come up to me on the schoolyard and said, look, kid, this is what you have to look forward to. So you wouldn't have wanted to hear you? No, I would have sunk my teeth right into my adult ankle and run off. And I think that's part of the wisdom of being a kid. Hey Howard, how how you doing? I'm okay, okay. Good. What? Uh, well, what are you doing now? Um, you know, I'm just uh, I'm just tending to some paperwork that I've got piled up here. You can do that any day. This is like I'm going to get you out of that office. I'm going to get you out from behind that desk. We're going to play some games. Like like go down and have a game of football or something? No, no football. I'm talking about you know no rules octopus rock tag. Excuse me? No rules octopus rock tag. Or the last time you played that. I don't think I've ever played that. What are you well, talking about? Of course you played that. This is what we played in elementary school all the time. That was our main game. Elementary? We were champs. We were division champs. We took on all the schools. Wow. I... You're great. You don't remember that. You can't, you can't remember No Rules Octopus Rock Tag. I think I have a vague stirring of uh, memory of maybe playing tag. Maybe... Well, I mean, it's more than tag. I mean, this is a game of strategy and skill. It's a game of tag like, like the Tour de France is like going out with your bike on training wheels. That's interesting, actually. As you're talking about this, what, what did you say it's called? It's called it's called uh, no, no rules, rules octopus rock no tag. No rules octopus rock tag. You see, I'm punching it into Google right now, and I'm getting nothing. Well, it isn't impossible that you dreamt this whole thing, maybe. Well, if it was a dream, then I mean, uh, we're talking about a very detailed uh, six years of elementary school, not including kindergarten. I mean, how do you pull this stuff out of your memory? I don't know. It's there. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, maybe if I just throw some details... Yeah, maybe just give me give me a little bit about it. Maybe okay. that'll jog my memory. Okay, so basically, no rules, octopus, rock tag. Okay. All right, so, so basically you're 10 and 10. Mm-hmm. You have shoes and shoeless. So you have the... Shoes and shoeless? Well, yeah, like, you know, like, right, one team basically takes off their shoes. The other, you know, you, your shoes are on, but you've got to tie your shoelaces to the, to the person on your right. Mm -hmm. Shoelaces, so you tie the shoelaces together, and... None of this is it doesn't ring a bell for you. So far, no. You have a rock, mm -hmm. and it's got to be like a walnut, no okay. bigger, no smaller. Uh huh. And basically, you flip the stone. Each team calls heads or tails. So how how would I mean? I don't even know why I'm asking this, but how how, how would you describe the the head side of a rock? Well, I mean, I guess you just kind of choose maybe the one that looks more like a face or something. I mean, I don't know. It's not like we had money. If I had a penny on me. I guess we'd be happy to use the penny, but it's not like I had any money on me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, we we use what we could. So, okay, so let's say, like, let's say your team wins if you're on the other team, right? So you, mm -hmm. and then you yell, sticks and stones, and then the other team, let's say my team, for example, would yell, break your bones. Okay. okay. So I'm going to yell, sticks and stones, mm -hmm. and you yell, break your bones. So, sticks and stones. Sticks and stones. No, no, you got to say, break your bones. Oh, like, okay. It's from an old rhyme, sticks and stones will break, you know, may break my bones. Right. Okay. Okay. So, sticks and stones. Break your bones. Right. The third of the shoe throws the rock, and with any luck for the shoeless, someone will get hit by the rock. The team that gets hit by the rock... Wait, you mean, you mean the kid that gets hit by the rock? 
well, they're a team, right? Because you got one on top of the other shoulders. Light kit's on top. Isn't isn't that going to be really bad for your spine? It's a, it's a schoolyard game. I mean, like you know, I can imagine they're, they're right. It's almost like a baseball diamond, but except it's rectangular and very narrow. So you're about 20 paces from each other, but you're only about. Basically, there's a kind of a scrum around mm -hmm. the, the fallen stone, mm -hmm. and each kid has to grab the kid to his left hair. That I, sounds awful. I, I didn't even phase me. I didn't even phase me. Where was I? Um, you have to toss the can back with two-handed toss to your Nelly. The Nelly is the person. Mm -hmm. They have. You basically have to evade the other team. Mm -hmm. John? Mm -hmm. John? Hello? Yeah. Okay, I don't think you're paying attention here. You basically have to evade the other team, mm -hmm. and you have to crack the can in half and basically push it together to make a small can. If there's a freeze, you can basically tag with hands or a rock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when I basically killed my, my mailman, and I, and I buried him under the floorboards. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. You that's is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, you, I got you're not that. listening to anything I'm saying. Yeah, I am of course I am. I, I what did I just say? About uh when you're in a scrum with the stick and you can't pick it up unless you're Okay. Okay. I mean it's clear that like not only you're not listening, but I don't I don't just think you even care. I don't think you even care about this. Well, I mean, Howard, I I do, but I mean, you know, you're you're reeling out pages and pages of of of, of rules and and which are like like sound as though you're making them up as you go along. You no, know, these are. I mean, these are these are regulation rules. But I, okay, well, all right, fine. But like like what I what you haven't even told me is like what what is the object of the game? How does one win? I mean, how do you win? How do you win? Yeah. I mean, that should be the most basic thing about any game. How do you win? How does one, you know, score points? Well, I mean, I, can t I, I, I mean, how do you win? I mean... You have no idea, do you? I mean, I mean how, how do you win How do you win doing a cannonball in a swimming pool? How do you win... I mean, I mean do you remember childhood at all, even? I mean, do you have even any recollection of, of, of your youth? I, I, I do, but I mean, I, I think... I, I mean, remember the turf when we used to meet in the in the morning before the bell and, and, and you know, looking at the woods behind the school and wondering, like, you know, what's in there, going to Mrs. Tester's class and wondering what she looks like nude and, and, and the smell of eraser dust and, and, I mean, who wins, who loses. I mean, it just seems so irrelevant. I mean, like, every day of my life is just filled with, like, rules and attaining goals and, like, mm -hmm. I'm talking about freedom. I'm talking about, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the joy of youth. And, I, I know what you're talking about. And energy spent and a good time had by all, you know? Yeah. You know? All right. Well, okay, look, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, uh, I'm, I'm going to just wrap this stuff you, up you, here. You're going right. to come today? What the hell, yeah. I'll, I'll get out of here and I'll just, I'll, I'll meet up with you guys. Sure. Uh, who's playing? Uh, well, right now it'll just be me and you. What are you talking about? Well, I, everybody else was kind of too busy. They, they were too busy, eh? Right. Well, so how how, how are we going to play just me and you? Well, we'll go, we'll warm up a bit and try out some different strategies, and we'll just head down to the schoolyard. Just run up a quick game. They're all going to be into it. They're kids, and I mean, they haven't forgotten. You're suggesting that we play with a whole bunch of children? Well, why not? It's a kids' game. You, you're saying we're going to go down to the schoolyard? Yeah. We're going to round up a whole bunch of kids? Right. And, and, and we're gonna like we're gonna hoist them onto our shoulders, just like adult men. Depends on on the rock throw. We can end up on their shoulders. You, I mean, you worry too much. The kids are gonna really like it. So you know, if, if you do well against those kids. We're going to the junior high down the street. Then senior high. Next time we
days. High rights, low lefts, see the Stevens and Fades. Shoot slidos and BKs on what the days. High tech boots, they painted with your names. T shirts, airbrush, they read the same. They carry bone chain. One go with your initial. Harris photos, group shots, can you remember? Dudes got money in my click card credit. Wherever I go, they win, they my buddy. I brush teeth. Brush naps and cross streets, dreaming of Cadillacs, wood wheels and plush seats, cats with gold teeth and raps with such beats, max with no grievance of sacks of green leaf. When I loaded my cap gun, I was ready for action, staring at beer cans in the moment to crack one. Wanna hang with the big boys and play with the big toys and be with the people making all that damn noise. We were trying so hard, hard to survive. On Wiretap Today, you heard Gregor Ehrlich and Howard Chakowitz.